Uh, I'm going to share with you the definition of our testimony to integrity, which um, comes from the conservative Quakers of America, as opposed to CYM. They argue that integrity is our most important testimony because it is the one that all the other testimonies are based on. At its simplest, the testimony of integrity means that we believe that it is wrong to lie, and we try to tell the truth in all things and at all times. We do not take oaths because Christ has forbidden it, and we believe it sets up a double standard for telling the truth. On a deeper level, the testimony to in of integrity means that we believe it is important for the whole of our lives to be consistent with our Christian beliefs uh, for this group of friends. And we believe we need to walk our talk, or as George Fox said, let our lives preach. All right, so the, the one that came easily to mind for me was Matthew 5. Uh, and he starts off, to, Jesus is talking about a number of practices. First, concerning almsgiving. Be aware of practicing your piety before others in order to be seen by them, for then you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give alms, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be praised by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their award, reward. But when you do give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your alms may be done in secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will reward you. And concerning prayer, Jesus' advice is against public prayer, in fact. Whenever you do pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners so that they may be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But whenever you pray, go into your room, some translations have closet, and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret. Your father who sees in secret will reward you. When you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. And whenever you fast, do not look dismal like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces so as to show others that they are fasting. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that your fasting may be seen not by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So Jesus' definition of integrity is basically no matter who's watching, we live up to our principles, right? Around this, um, this verse 7, I thought I would tell you a sort of funny story of a spiritual experience I had very, very early in my recovery from alcoholism and drugs. I was, uh, I was still living in Duncan, so I know it was in the first year, and I was praying at the side of my bed about something, and it doesn't matter now what, but I know that I was being very dramatic. And um, I heard God say to me, cut the crap. <laughs> I already know what you need, and we can just have a conversation about this. Um, <laughs> so clearly I'm a Gentile guilty of the, of the criticism in verse 7. Um, so aside from the piece about, um, you know, doing in secret, what, living up to, to uh, our principles no matter who's watching, I also wanted to point out the difference between the language that Matthew uses and the language that John uses that we discussed yesterday, where John is always talking about the Jews. Um, and in Matthew, Jesus, he criticizes the hypocrites, right? So it's not an ethnic issue, it's a, uh, it's a moral conviction. Uh, so just a contrast where those uh, differences lie between the gospel writer's language. Uh, and then finally, Matthew 15, 6. For the sake of your tradition, you have made void the word of God, you hypocrites. 
Well did Isaiah prophesy of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain they do worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. So let's talk about the biblical witness against integrity. And this is a lot of fun, I think. <laughs> uh, Tamar, Genesis 38. This is a great story. <laughs> so um, a woman's role at this point in time was to provide an heir for the family that she had married into, right? And young men often died before they produced an heir. And so the oldest brother, if he would be married off first, and if he died first, then his younger brother would be expected to produce an heir for him, and the children would be his posthumously. And this all sounds a little weird from our cultural point of view, but that's the way it worked. And the, because this was a woman's duty and, and honor to provide heirs to her family, it was important that, that, that this tradition be recognized. So they were doing an injustice to Tamar when they, when they didn't allow her to marry the third son, right? And she stood up for herself in this great way and uh, tricked her father-in-law into getting her pregnant. Um, one thing about Onan, this, it's just an interesting piece of trivia, this verse is usually um, cited as, as the argument against masturbation, right? But uh, yes, but actually, right, so both. And in this case, the, the sin is the coitus interruptus, um, and the, but his duty to, the real sin is the duty he had to Tamar to produce, and to his family, to produce an heir. Um, and it's not so much the dreaded sin of Onan that we've come to consider. Um, but my point in having the story read is that this is a powerful woman who tells the lies she needs to tell, not only to honor herself, um, but we find out later in the Bible to play her part in God's will for the world. So, uh, Rahab, somebody has Joshua 2. So the Lord accomplishes his intentions for the people through the lie of a woman, and no less a harlot. All right, the wise men's, um, sorry, the birth and adoption of Moses, Exodus 2. So again, a story of uh, women being pretty sneaky to save the life of a man who becomes important in God's will for the world. Um, but it's not just women who lie in the Bible. Uh, sometimes we're led to think that, but it's not so much. So the wise men's protection of Jesus from Matthew 2. the breach of a promise to protect Jesus. All right, Peter's betrayal of Jesus from Mark 14. And Judas' betrayal of Jesus, do you have? So I'm particularly interested in those last two scriptures because, I, well, for a couple of reasons. One, we tend to demonize Judas an awful lot where we don't demonize Peter, even though they essentially did the same thing, which I find really curious and haven't done enough research to make sense of. Um, you know, Peter becomes the rock of the church and Judas goes on forever being the, what we call a betrayer. It's, it's interesting, <laughs> that piece is interesting to me. Um, but the other thing that's interesting to me is the fact that we demonize them at all because we wouldn't have a resurrection unless we had a crucifixion, right? So it's my contention that um, people who have a, a, a fairly literal understanding of, of Jesus' death and resurrection, probably rather than demonizing Jewish people and Judas in particular, well, either way, um, should in fact be thanking them for their role in bringing about God's will for the world, right? Pretty ridiculous that we uh, fault people for doing what God needed to have happen in order for this good thing to come about. But um, the larger point I wanted to make here is that I think that flexibility around this testimony is a place where Quakers have really shone historically. 
Obviously, those involved in the Underground Railroad and in rescuing Jews from Nazi Germany privileged a wider understanding of integrity than simply a legalistic adherence to truth-telling, right? Their actions matched what was in their hearts. And I also hope that you will remember um, these ex examples of active deceit, particularly by women, as essential to the story of, a, of how God apparently gets things done. So, queries for integrity. How comfortable are you with your personal standard of integrity? Do you apply this testimony rigorously in your life? And have you forgiven yourself for occasionally breaching it without sufficient cause? And also, if you save dishonesty for special occasions, how do you discern its use? We'll worship very briefly. Um, we're going to talk about community now. And I'm going to use less academic sources um, for this section, and we're actually going to look at a couple of web pages. Um, the first one, I'll find the name in a minute, Knowing Jesus. It's from a web page called Knowing Jesus. So uh, the scriptural citations for this will be in the notes that are going up on the website. But starting with 1 Corinthians 12, uh, there are a variety of gifts, but the same spirit. And there are varieties of ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. From Romans 12, since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. And there are, uh, there's quite a long list, you'll see if you look at the notes, of information from Paul um, that cites how we all have our own strengths. And interestingly, this author from Knowing Jesus is saying this is evidence of the important, importance of individuals. And I'm not convinced that he makes his argument very well, because for those of you who have read the Pauline epistles, you know that these are, in fact, instructions to community, right? So um, each of these verses this man has used to bolster individuality as God's um, preference are taken out of a context where um, P uh, Paul is telling people to exercise their gifts in community and to recognize um, their gift in the context of the community. Somebody who I think makes a much better argument, uh, or a website that makes much better argument, is called gotquestions.org. And I may have mentioned this website yesterday. I will say I don't agree with their overall theological agenda, um, but I think they do a good job on this particular issue. So um, Luke 19, 11 through 27. Luke 15, please. So I've always loved the Gospel of Luke and said it was my favorite because in it Jesus is forever going off to pray by himself. And it <laughs> reminds me of the importance of um, personal devotion um, for the sake of sustainability. I had never noticed before because I don't think this way. Uh, until I read this website about how much Luke uh, emphasizes the value of the individual. But GodQuestions.org says that uh, even though it's clear from this chapter that, that God really values the individual, when the lost is found, there is always rejoicing. And so there's, there's this very... Um, balanced take on the importance of the individual. 
And when we compare that with the Pauline writings, the, the various letters to the early communities, we see the same thing, that um, the body has many parts and, and nothing functions as well without all of the others. So um, those two websites both cite the New Testament instructions, but if we look at the Bible as a whole, we still see the value of, the, um, of community. So many of the over 600 commandments in the Hebrew scriptures are setting standards of conduct, hygiene, generosity, and so on, that are designed to make it easier to live in community and to welcome strangers. The God of the Hebrew scriptures cares deeply about the success of his community. And this is where Jesus has learned to call people to community. Indeed, he asked people to abandon their families if necessary in order to be part of God's sacred community. And there is his clear demand for people to pool their resources in order to show their fidelity to community. There is also a great effort to bring people in, right? Jesus is going to make people fishers of men who will be part of this community. And some argue that this inclusiveness is the actual miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Who has Mark 6? So um, in Sunday school, I was always taught that this was, you know, a miracle of Jesus, that he was powerful enough to to produce all of this food out of the five loaves and two fishes. Um, but I prefer uh, an interpretation I first heard from Bert Horwood, which probably isn't original to Bert, but I don't know, um, that the miracle here is actually that people felt they couldn't share because of the purity laws and that they would be um, violating kosher principles if they shared their food. And so Jesus, by giving people permission to share, um, had demonstrated that it was okay to pull the food you had with you out from underneath your cloak so that everybody could share with each other and be fed, right? So instead of the disciples um, suggesting that everybody, following their suggestion that everybody fend for themselves, Jesus got people to share in this way that ensured everybody was fed. Um, and then, as I've mentioned, all of Paul's letters to the new Christian communities are instructions on how to behave as communities. Um, and there's a particular passage that I think you all know, or many of you will know, um, that's so often taken out of context and removed from, from its background and community. So does anybody have 1 Corinthians 13? Uh, probably. We have a mic. The gift of love. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful. It is not arrogant or rude. Love does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrong, but rejoices in the right. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For our knowledge is imperfect, and our prophecy is imperfect. But when the perfect comes, the imperfect will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, 
but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall understand fully, even as I have been fully understood. So faith, hope, love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. Thank you. So it's pretty ironic that we always read this at weddings because Paul was pretty busy telling people that the end of the world was coming and you probably shouldn't get married. <laughs> you could if you absolutely had to, but it was better to stay single uh, given that the end was nigh. Uh, so then, obviously, these are his instructions to us in how to behave in, in community. So conservative friends say that the testimony of community is extremely important, particularly in this age of individualism. Friends take seriously Jesus' admonition to love each other, as well as Paul's admonition to subject ourselves to each other. If we really are the body of Christ, and all the parts need one another, as the gospel says, then it isn't right for one part to be off doing its own thing separate from the body. The Lord can and does do a lot through people as individuals, but the real power of the gospel shows itself when we function as a united body, witnessing to the world what God has done among us. And this is true of the Hebrew scriptures as well. So queries. Our testimony of community is clearly an important one, especially in this age supposedly characterized by rabid individualism. Do you ensure that your desire to main our community as it has been does not get in the way of progress? Are you open to what new vision of community spirit may be trying to bring about? And two, friends are not immune to bullying and martyrdom. Do you allow yourself to be right-sized in your spiritual community, being sure to welcome and include others in balance with your own needs? Is there a balance of proper give and take in your meeting? We'll just have a moment of worship. <clears throat> 